and I would like to introduce Mark Grayson on stage. Please give him a big hand. He's going to talk about use case driven transformation of the indoor networks. I had to practice that a bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I'd like to talk about um, 5G. We heard it in the previous talk. Um, and say, well, what's it going to do to the indoor, to the campus network? Because I guess on reflection, did 4G ever do anything for the indoor network? Uh, and so talk about what the promise is, what the focus is around um, 5G. Been in Cisco quite a while, uh, interesting discussion on Wi-Fi versus 5G. Uh, I was involved in some of the first Wi-Fi deployments in Cisco 2001 when we deployed Aeronet. Some of the early EAP SIM trials, 2002. Um, to the latest small cell deployments, we deployed two million small cells within AT&T, so, so those, those are 3G small cells. Um, and obviously, we're, we're progressing now, and the focus is on, on 5G to understand how this is targeting the indoor network. So is it time for the next generation of, of, of networking? Um, obviously, we've gone through the generations in the past. We're going to get a new generation. Um, so appreciating not all of you deal with 5G day to day. So, so, so 5G, the system architecture was just completed last week. Um, then they will go into the, the sort of stage three protocol work uh, during 2018, sort of September 2018 is when, when 5G, the first release is, is notionally complete. And so what, what is 5G? 5G is going to be a new radio. And guess what they've called it? They've called it new radio. Um, real, real, real good branding there. Um, so, so that's all about um, um, MIMO, massive MIMO, but also operating in new spectrum bands. Conventionally, we've been used to operating in Europe here sub three gigahertz in terms of LTE. Um, 5G is going to uh, be defined in, in sub six, so all of the frequencies we're used to is going to be 5G but we're going to get new millimeter wave. So the pioneer bands in Europe are 24 gigahertz. So we're going to see mobile operation move up in spectrum uh, in frequency. And obviously, that comes with unique challenges with propagation as we get into millimeter wave. So we're going to get a new radio. We're also going to get a new core. Uh, we're going to get you know, virtualization being applied to the core, automation being applied to the core, and new capabilities uh, which is termed network slicing. Um, so how do we partition the network and, and enable multiple tenants to operate on that? That could be virtual network operators, or it could be enterprises, it could be uh, academic institutions all having that slice of the network. Equally, it could be a slice for IoT, it could be a slice for consumer and the like, uh, as well as edge computing because 5G is the first time we're going to, um, we've virtualized the core already in 4G. So we're running virtualized cores. We're going to virtualize the radio access network in 5G. That means we're going to run um, access workloads, RAN workloads on compute. Therefore, compute is going to shift out to the edge of the network um, and be a platform for other innovations as well. So that's 5G. Notionally, completion specification, as I said, next year. Uh, it's going to be in MNO labs next year. Then likely, you know, limited field trials 2019, maybe commercial 2020 as, as a rough timeline. Um, okay, so so so, so what? Um, so from a 5G focus, what we see is a shift in focus. So it's fair to say is that today, you know, video is driving loads on networks, but not necessarily revenue. And so obviously the whole industry is saying, if I'm going to invest in 5G, where is going to be my, my payback? Where is the upside in terms of revenue? And there is general consensus within the, the industry that the focus is um, for the new revenue is not going to be on consumer. It's going to be on these new vertical value chains, and in particular, focusing on enterprise. Um, and this is seeing us, you know, uh, tying with a similar transformation that's happening within the enterprise network. You know, I saw a, a stat yesterday from a U.S. Uh, um, vertical, which saying already 62% of their workforce was mobile. 
72% of their enterprise workloads were already running from the cloud, and therefore we, we, we're moving towards a perimeterless enterprise, which is then you know, ready to a, a, adopt a sort of a mobile-first strategy. And so there is the aspiration from the operators to address the enterprise. And we shall go further in this presentation about, well, that's clearly an aspiration. New revenue is always an aspiration. But what are the challenges of them serving that, those new opportunities? And so, so here we see um, a, a survey from uh, GSM Association. So the, the, the group representing the operators saying 56% yeah, say that new revenue is going to come from, from enterprises. Uh, and equally, you know, Cisco as, as, as an ent enterprise vendor, um, uh, th those same surveys are saying, hey, 5G is going to be a risk uh, as we see a transition moving forward. So I'd like, like to dig into that um, a little deeper, because obviously that, that plays an Im implication for ourselves as well as yourselves for, from a, a, an academic perspective. So we're going to revolutionize the network. And so maybe we can split it into, into two. We're going to look at the outdoor network to serve more traffic. Uh, we've talked about higher frequencies. Higher frequencies mean smaller cell sites. Um, and a, a, a good sort of... Uh, definition of a hyper-dense outdoor network is of the order of 100 to 150 cell sites per square kilometer. So maybe an order of magnitude above where we are today from, from the, the outdoor network. So, so clearly, you know, quite a big transformation happening in the, in the, the outdoor network. But now looking at the, the enterprise, you know, the, the aspiration to support um, new vertical value chains, um, looking at how we leverage that edge compute uh, with, with API-based exposure of, of value creation enablers. And we're going to talk a little bit about you know, the challenge of, of, of multi-operator and neutral host, which uh, we're all aware of. One of the, uh, the, the key challenges in deploying you know, LTE networks today is, is how do we serve the public better? And that's serving them irrespective of their carrier affiliation, so, so looking at, at uh, multi-operator challenges. And irrespective of whether it's outside or inside, it's going to be sliced, it's going to be virtualized, it's going to be orchestrated, and it's going to be automated. OK. So we still face this, this problem of, of how to bridge this, this divide. So we've got this hyperdense outdoor, and we've got this digitized enterprise indoors. And where are we today? To the question before, you know, 3GPP, LTE, 3G, largely serving that, that hyperdense outdoor networks. We see some metropolitan Wi-Fi networks, but majority of traffic outdoors served by 3GPP. Equally, the majority of, of indoor traffic is served by Wi-Fi. And then we've got this barrier between the two. Um, increasingly, the green building initiative is making these buildings more thermally efficient um, to stop um, thermal radiation leaking out of the building. When we make those buildings thermally efficient, we make it very hard for radio waves to penetrate the buildings. And so an anecdote that, that uh, Cisco Workplace Resources embarked on a, 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 an efficiency campaign to improve the thermal efficiency of our campus in Boston. So they wanted to save money by, by making the building uh, more thermally protected. They applied their films to the, to the windows and found they had no RF coverage, so they then had to install a DAS system to provide cellular coverage indoors. So highlighting some of the problems we face moving forward. And just looking at like where people are, so this is from Cisco VNI, about where do people consume data. Um, and candidly, you know, the on-the-go is, is, is still quite low. And the majority of consumption, I think, as we'll all reflect, is when we are sitting down, when we're in indoor buildings. And so if the indoor buildings are going to get it harder to surf from outdoors, the only way we're going to be successful is to deploy indoor radio systems. And obviously, that's what we've been doing to date in terms of Wi-Fi serving that indoor traffic. And so we pose the question about, well, how is 5G going to be successful at being deployed indoors? What's going to change? Because candidly, LTE hasn't been that successful in serving that, that indoor opportunity. Cisco, you know, for, for the last decade, has tried to be successful in delivering 3GPP wireless systems indoors. 
and we've had some success in terms of residential, but, but largely from an enterprise perspective, this market has failed to materialize. So what's going to change? What's going to change? Well, the, if you look at the analysts, the analysts say not much is going to change. So, so this is looking at global spend of indoor wireless infrastructure. And it says today, 70% of spend goes on Wi-Fi. The other 30% goes on a combination of DAS and small cells. And over the time horizon um, uh, shown by this particular analyst, they say the 70% of Wi-Fi doesn't, isn't predicted to, ch to change, but we're going to see a substitution of revenue between the DAS and the small cells. So you can see that we, we're having sort of increasing small cell spend and diminishing DAS spend. So the analysts are saying, OK, so what for 5G? From a spend perspective, Wi-Fi is still going to continue. And so we've got to ask ourselves, well, well why is that the case? And is anything going to change which is going to um, uh, change this, this particular prediction? So if we want to serve the, the wireless enterprise, that then what are the challenges moving forward? Um, and so, so this is a, a very basic chart looking at, hey, how much demand do we need to serve from the wireless enterprise? And so this looked at some statistics of, of how much traffic people consume during the busy hour um, uh, within an office environment, looking at uh, predictions 2020, 2025. And then sort of mapping that to building occupancy. Now, recognizing that, that you uh, support educational establishments, and they have very unique characteristics in terms of density of users. So this is just looking at the average of building occupancies, in fact, from, from a UK perspective, and saying the effective um, uh, carpeted space per user is 10 square meters. Um, within the UK, and where we have now an effective occupancy of 55%, we can then map that to how much traffic we need to serve. And we get, uh, accordingly, Wi-Fi coverage. Um, and well, let's see if we can do it from a small cell perspective. What does this show us in terms of the build? So moving forward, it says, hey, Wi-Fi is going to serve our traffic well. Um, if we're looking at the next generation of Wi-Fi technology, which we'll go on to in the next chart, 802.11ax, um, that looks to be sufficient to support our, our Wi-Fi traffic. And we compare it with small cells, today's LTE small cells. What this says today, using today's technology, I, I would need to have between 70 megahertz and 200 megahertz of, of LTE bandwidth. That means either four, four radios to 10 radios. So each LTE radio is 20 megahertz wide. So I need four times 20 to serve my 2020 consumption, or, or 10 times 20 to serve my 2025 consumption. Clearly, that's uneconomical. You know, I've got a single Wi-Fi radio versus 10 LTE radios. And so we can say from this chart that LTE isn't going to substitute Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is always going to be there to support the heavy lifting of traffic, at least over this particular time horizon. And so we see the, the opportunity there is of these 3GBP technologies of complementing now that, that Wi-Fi base. So we mentioned data 211 ax We've got to say, when we look at 5G and the time horizon of 5G, you know, uh, uh, 2020 and beyond, we're going to be deploying 811 ax This is the next generation of, of Wi-Fi standardization, uh, currently targeted for completion in 2019. But we will see products in the market from next year. So just uh, if you remember 802.11ac, we saw release one AC products being uh, deployed before full certification. We're going to see this, the same happen with AX. So next year, we're going to see AX products. 
Um, and why is, why is that interesting? It is, I would say that AX, we're seeing the biggest divergence um, and the, the biggest innovation from a, from a Mac perspective. For the first time, we have multi-user uplink. We have a scheduled uplink with 802.11ax. The figure tries to show that. We have a trigger frame, and the trigger frame then allows people to share a single transmission opportunity in the uplink. So no longer contending for access, we can schedule access to individual users. And this capabilities was seen as the big deficiency of Wi-Fi that I always needed to contend for access, and I had quite poor performance when the, the network was, was uh, increased in density. And because we're moving to that centralized uh, um, scheduling approach, we dramatically improve the Wi-Fi performance. Sufficient that the, just the, the, the WBA published the, the figure on the right-hand side, which compared 8211X performance with the benchmark requirements for 5G, which is coming out of uh, ITU. And you can see, in, in many regards, we can support many of the 5G requirements with, with Wi-Fi. Certainly, others we can't. For example, high-speed mobility, supporting mobility to, to trains, that 500 kilometer an hour perspective, Wi-Fi clearly isn't going to compete with cellular for those extreme use cases. But you can see, for other use cases, Wi-Fi is going to do a great job at meeting those, in those particular requirements. So, and, and a great quote, so the divergence between 3GBP and, and 8211 max are, are going to diminish over time. And, and some of the rationale that has um, forced or, or motivated 3GBP to operate in unlicensed bands, and we'll talk about unlicensed bands, is because of this change in MAC design. But one of the challenges, hey, but we, we still need to get all of the users authenticated onto Wi-Fi. It, it, you know, we've got these great capabilities with 802.11ax. We still need to get everyone on the network. Um, and, and yourselves and educational establishment, SurfNet in particular, EduRome has done a fantastic job on that. Um, but candidly, this isn't just about an education vertical. This is about every single vertical needs to support public guest use cases. So this isn't just a carrier Wi-Fi problem for service providers. It isn't just an educational problem for uh, uh, you know, higher educational establishments. It's every single vertical needs to better serve uh, users uh, of the system. And, and what happens today is, is we have that awful captive portal. We have the black holing of, of, of packets. We have applications which don't work, and we have people turning off Wi-Fi uh, to get their applications to, to continue to work. Um, so certainly this is a focus of, of some of our work in Cisco about how do we ensure to get every user who's got a Wi-Fi device with Wi-Fi enabled onto a Wi-Fi network. And, you know, uh, EduRome shows what can be done. You know, two and a half billion authentications in a year from a single vertical. What is the opportunity of us taking that sort of same technology and applying it more broadly outside of just one vertical and making everyone uh, that same concept uh, being applied now to every single vertical out there? And so that's some of the work that we're, that we're, that we're doing um, from a Cisco perspective, looking at this particular problem, not just from education, but, but from every single um, vertical perspective. So just a single slide on some improvements. Because we move to a scheduled multi-user uplink, we anticipate significant benefits of Wi-Fi performance. So typically, because we're contended uh, on Wi-Fi, the more and more users, they, they, the increased density, we see a, a degradation in performance. The chart shows that, that because we can support now multiple users on the uplink and we schedule, we don't see that corresponding degradation in performance. Okay, so, so some of the issues that we have today are absolutely going to be addressed with 802.11ax, particularly around the, the high density types of deployments. So we're going to get new capabilities with Wi-Fi, but we still face a challenge when we look at 
3GPP technologies. And this isn't particularly around the technology per se. It's more around the licensing regime. And so apologies, this is how you determine the, 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 the coverage of a particular wireless system is you understand how much power you can transmit, how, much, how little power you can receive, and obviously the difference is, is your path loss. You can then equate that to distance. So what we're doing here is, is we're comparing uh, Wi-Fi operating in 5 gigahertz with um, another technology which is getting a lot of interest, which is called CBRS, Citizens Broadband Radio Service, um, at, at broadband radio service out of the US. Um, and this is looking at private LTE operation in that particular band. And it's saying on the downlink, you can see here when I compare Wi-Fi with, with, with CBRS, which is an LTE technology, that there is 16 dBs difference in that path loss. What does that equate to? In a typical rule of thumb, that 60% reduction in coverage of Wi-Fi compared with what I can get from the downlink in LTE because of regulation. When we look in the uplink, things are a little bit more balanced. Um, and in particular, the latest iPhones you know, perform far better than the earlier uh, iPhones. So I, I just looked at the FCC uh, report for iPhone 8. You can see how much that's going to transmit in 5 gigahertz. And we can do the, the similar equation on the uplink. But still, you can see there's a disparity between what we can get on Wi-Fi uplink versus uh, 3GPP uplink. Here we can see a 25 reduction in coverage area when we compare those link budgets. And so always what we see is, is when we want to cover wider areas, um, then we see a motivation to, to look to 3GPP technologies because they can operate in these bands when I can emit higher powers and the handsets can typically admit more power than I can from a Wi-Fi uh, device today. So, so this is driving some of the early adoptions of, of private LTE networks um, across, across the globe. So back to the challenge of, of deploying in the enterprise um, about how do we motivate carriers to engage in deploying indoor networks. Um, and this is a chart shown by, by mobile experts, uh, analysts there called Joe Madden, which is looking at the economic return of deploying an indoor wireless network. And, and they look at the, he looks at the economic return to the service provider and the economic return to the enterprise. And you can see straight away that there's a, a, over a 10 to 1 disparity in, in the value of that indoor system. The enterprise is obtaining far more value from that system than the carrier if the carrier is simply monetizing it using their conventional techniques. And we think this is, this is one of the real challenges because just like indoor systems today, every carrier will typically have a budget for indoor systems. Um, they will rank all of their uh, requirements, and they will, they'll go down the list, and they will simply uh, serve the highest priority when they can get the, the best return on investment. But, but this will leave the vast majority of, of indoor users you know, without indoor coverage. And this highlights, I think, where the first chart around 5G saying we have an aspiration to serve the enterprise from a 5G perspective. What this is saying from a, a return on investment is the carrier could absolutely, absolutely be the, the, the barrier to indoor deployment because they're only interested in serving one particular business model, their, their existing business model, whereas indoor wireless is about serving different business models. Uh, you know, we deploy Wi-Fi because it increases worker productivity. We don't deploy Wi-Fi because we want to sort of monetize or offload particular data, and we see that as an economic return. It's all about particular value chains. So how do we incentivize carriers to support solutions w w when, the, when the vertical gets disproportionate returns? This, this is an industry problem that we need to face. The other challenge, as we said, is, is we need to simplify sharing. And so this is a report from Small Cell Forum, obviously an industry um, a trade body, 
uh, for the small cell industry, as well as 5G Americas, which is uh, the, the trade body of the, of the US operators. Um, and they have a, re um, a report about multi-operator neutral or small cells, and it, it, we've got some good quotes from this report. So the need of many enterprises, venues, and verticals to serve all visitors, irrespective of carrier affiliation, is one of the key deployment requirements for indoor small cells. Absolutely, we all get it. And I think as an industry, we now recognize that the indoor small cell systems have largely failed because they're not serving the needs of the enterprise. So what are the barriers? It's not just about technology. It's about business. Um, if we're deploying shared infrastructure, you know, what, how do we share risks? How do we share costs? It's about the reg regulatory regime. Often the regulator will look at sharing and be cautious that sharing is going to impact its competition regimes. And therefore, typically, when you're approaching a, a shared network, you need to involve the regulator to give them confidence that, that competition isn't going to be diminished. And the whole management KPIs reporting of this system um, are, are, are problematic. Um, and, and so what does the small cell forum and the mobile operators conclude? The impact of that is because of those barriers is, is Wi-Fi is the default small cell technology for multi-operator support. So how is it going to change moving forward? So how is it going to change moving forward is that we're going to look at many of those barriers were to do with the spectrum. Sharing exclusive spectrum is, is difficult. There are very few examples of, of, of operators actually sharing their own exclusive spectrum. So the opportunity is to look at new spectrum. A new spectrum is coming online, which is more amenable to sharing. A lot, I would say, the focus of the industry at the moment is on, I wouldn't call it this US experiment, but it's, it's, uh, it certainly is very innovative, called CBRS. And this is looking at 150 megahertz of, of spectrum. Now, the problem with this spectrum, this spectrum is in 3.5 gigahertz, which is, you know, um, mid-band spectrum. In Europe, we would call that primary band for 5G. Now, unfortunately, from a US perspective, their Aegis radar, 4 megawatts of Aegis radar, uses the same frequency. So if they had to free up the spectrum, they would have to pay the, the, the Department of Defense a lot of money to move their, their Aegis radars out of the band. And so they said, well, instead of doing that, let's deploy an innovative sharing system. So you can basically lease spectrum. You, you provide your geolocation and say, I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to lease some spectrum. And if you're in Oklahoma, you never have going to have an Aegis radar around you, and so it's going to be uh, uh, quite easy to, to lease some spectrum. Um, and then you can operate this as an LTE uh, network. Similarly, if you're in San Diego, if you're in Norfolk, Virginia, when they have big naval uh, um, uh, installations, it's going to be more problematic, but you're going to uh, um, uh, ask for a leased spectrum, pretty much like DHCP today. I want to lease some spectrum for a particular period of time. And that's going to operate in two modes of operation. GAA means that it's effectively uh, generalized authorized access, so anyone can operate LTE networks in the US. And this rulemaking is going to happen mid next year. So a huge innovation which has been driven in the US because we have 150 megahertz of spectrum open to everyone. And they can then start building networks. And so we're seeing uh, interest from uh, industry verticals about how they then use these private LTE systems to support their businesses. So that's, that's I would say, a focus of the industry. But, but equally, we see other examples uh, the French regulator earlier this year said that they're going to open band 38, which is 2.6 gigahertz, to, to, to private and enterprise usage. Uh, Japan, um, we, we, we can share some 1.9 uh, gigahertz spectrum with, with their PHS uh, system. Uh, and Australia, we see all of the Australian mining uh, establishments deploying their own private LTE networks on, on 30 megahertz of spectrum that the Australian regulator has, has allowed them to use within rural Australia. 
Um, and obviously, I guess we started this in terms of uh, uh, Holland and, uh, and the UK. You know, back 2006, we, we looked at the deck guard band um, and opened that up for, for low power private GSM usage as well. So that's all, I would say, licensed or lightly licensed bands. Obviously, the, the, the focus is equally about 5 gigahertz. So you might have heard uh, around technologies called license-assisted access. So this is 3GBP LTE operating in 5 gigahertz band. And quite a lot of work that we've been doing is to in, uh, ensure the fair coexistence between that LTE network and the Wi-Fi network so they can coexist. But that's called band 46. Um, and what we're getting in 3GBP is, is definition of, of what's called non-standalone non operation in unlicensed. You can operate in unlicensed, but you need to anchor onto a licensed system. So it's, it's a supplemental um, downlink capability. So clearly some innovation happening from a spectrum perspective. The other interesting innovation is around identity. And I think we've all been used to 3GPP cellular networks. Our identity is based on our SIM card. Well, in what 3GPP has done is said that if we are to serve new use cases, um, those new use cases may want to manage their own identities. And so they've borrowed from Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi has been very successful because it's built on EAP when we have built a, a, an authentication framework. And we've said we have many different EAP methods that you can support over that framework uh, and use your method according to your use case. Um, and 5G is going to be based on an EAP framework. So you're going to run EAP methods over 5G to authenticate uh, yourself onto the network. Obviously, they're focused on EAP AKA and the SIM card authentication. But there will be discussions about other EAP methods, and they're talking about EAP T, uh, TLS, TTLS. So, so this is coming from a 5G perspective. Very interesting, because now I can operate now this in, in private spectrum, uh, and I can now use private identities over 5G. But in advance of that, we are seeing industry consortium bringing these same capabilities to LTE. So there's a technology called Multifire being defined outside of 3GPP, which is defining uh, EAP-based support for uh, LTE systems, as well as unlicensed operations, standalone unlicensed operation for, for LTE systems. Um, and so what we're seeing is, is, is private systems being defined outside of 3GPP, but that is really then driving change within the whole 5G ecosystem, because these are clearly requirements from an identity and from a spectrum perspective. Wow. Good job we're inside, huh? Um, so, so we said that um, Multifire was defining their own system for standalone operation in, 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 in unlicensed bands. But this is sort of private. Now, the issue is, is which operator is going to mandate this capability on their device? Uh, are they really going to enable a new set of, of competitors? Uh, because Multifire is about sort of uh, lowering barriers to entry to, to other um, network operators. Um, and so when originally when Multifire Alliance or the companies behind Multifire Alliance went to 3GPP and saying, hey, we'd like to standardize this as part of 3GPP, the operators, the operators said, no, we're not going to allow you to take your Multifire specification and bring that into 3GPP. But we see already that they've adopted EAP. Um, and now they're studying what's called standalone operation. And so a little bit about how 3GPP works, that they study things typically in a release, and then they do the normative work as a work item. So this is currently being studied um, as part of the current release. And it is likely that as part of release 16, so finished sometime in 2019, we will have the definition now 
of 5G operation in unlicensed bands. And that's not just the 5 gigahertz bands that, that we're used to with Wi-Fi, but now looking at uh, 60, 70 gigahertz, as well as the new 6 gigahertz unlicensed band, which, which folks are discussing. So what do we see? We see parallel transformations of both Wi-Fi and new radio. Where are we today? Yeah, the majority of traffic is being carried over Wi-Fi. Cellular frequencies, really, and devices are delivering um, better outdoor coverage because of that link budget. With 8211AX, we're going to get a scheduled uplink. We're going to get improved determinism over Wi-Fi, improved predictability. We get some benefits for IoT that I haven't focused on, but the target wake time and some of the battery-saving technologies we get um, in 8211AX as well. Um, but from a cellular perspective, hey, they're moving to operating in non-exclusive spectrum. Shared spectrum, unlicensed spectrum, this is, this is going to be defined. Hey, all services can be accessible over Wi-Fi. Um, release 15, from a, a, a 3GPP perspective, we're going to get standardized EAP authentication. So if you want to run EAP TTLS over your 5G system, then, yep, it should be able to support it. From a core network perspective, both of these integrate into a common core network. Um, and, and it's really tight integration, I, I think, from a security perspective. Uh, unlike before, where largely your Wi-Fi network was an adjunct and, and separate from your 3 gpp network, they are now really very much integrated. Um, and obviously, the same time period, we're going to see service provider private LTE deployments. What our focus is from a Wi-Fi perspective is not just about the technology. It is about the onboarding. It's to learn from the success of Edge Your Own and how do we apply that more broadly to other verticals. Um, and then also, we're going to see from a, a new radio perspective, we're going to move from a 20 megahertz channel to an 80 megahertz channel for new radio, maybe up to 400 megahertz uh, channels when we're operating in millimeter waves. So we're going to see increased channelization, which was one of the key challenges of today's LTE networks. But also, I guess, we've got to uh, understand from an application perspective, uh, are we going to see all applications increasingly becoming multipath aware? This whole idea of handover is very 1990s. And now, with either uh, QUIC or MPTCP, are we going to just let applications decide which network uh, they operate over? Um, and so obviously, you know, really interesting developments with iOS 11, with, with, with that capability, uh, to understand how that allows us to address some of the limitations and these key barriers. So back to bridging between that indoor and outdoor divide? How, how can we bridge between the two? Well, seems to be three different approaches. We, we can enable all services over Wi-Fi. Uh, so that's our Wi-Fi calling. But it assumes that everyone is on the Wi-Fi network. So we need to address the onboarding. And we need to deliver um, all those services over Wi-Fi. Some of the challenges in enterprise networks, at least from a Cisco perspective, Cisco IT blocks outbound IPsec, which is the foundation of Wi-Fi calling. So I can't use Wi-Fi calling within, within the enterprise. Similarly, Vodafone bundles, from an enterprise perspective, don't enable Wi-Fi calling on their enterprise plan, not only their consumer plan. But, but the, the capabilities are there to enable all those services over Wi-Fi. We could deploy shared 3GPP systems within the building. We know that's a challenge. We know that may mean operating in new spectrum. And we know it may mean deploying without a carrier, because maybe they were the barrier originally for, for getting those, those multi-operator shared systems operating. Or that we can just uh, ensure that all applications are, are multipath capable and able to make that switch uh, and bridge the divide between indoor and outdoor networks. So. Summary, 8211AX is absolutely going to continue to evolve. You know, the, that centralized scheduler and the core capabilities 
are really addressing some of the limitations that, that led to multi-fire being defined, that led to LAA being defined by 3GPP. You know, if we look at 802.11ax, you, you have a random access. You, as a device, send your buffer status reports, and you get an allocated grant. What I just described was an LTE network, exactly the same system, which is now going to be used in Wi-Fi. So that clearly is going to address some of the, today's limitations. Key capabilities that which are being defined outside of 3GPP, in particular from a multi-fire perspective, are going to be rolled in to 3GPP. That means EAP authentication in release 15. So around 2020, we should be seeing EAP enabled 5G networks. And then maybe a year, two years later, we should see standardized operation of 5G in unlicensed bands, 5 gigahertz. A lot of focus on 6 gigahertz at the moment. So 6 to 7 is the new unlicensed band that folks are discussing, as well as operating in millimeter waves, so, so 60 gigahertz as well. Today, LTE's channelization means it can't compete with Wi-Fi for supporting that massive tonnage of mobile data. You know, Wi-Fi still has the advantage um, versus LTE. Focus is really on that wide area coverage, that improves path loss uh, to focus on, on those particular use cases. In parallel, we're going to see integration of Wi-Fi into the next generation core network. And so we're seeing Wi-Fi now being treated as a peer rather than being some, some sort of uh, subordinate, subordinated access from a 3GPP perspective. And finally, I guess the one that we don't know about, but obviously interesting from what's happening within Chrome, um, from a quick perspective, as well as iOS from a multipath TCP perspective, is about the application ecosystem and how quickly they will adapt the new uh, iOS capabilities to become multipath aware and how that will help then bridge the divide between these indoor networks and the outdoor networks. So, concludes my talk. So, really interesting time from an indoor perspective. You know, we're going to see this play out over the next number of years in terms of an increasing use of LTE by, by private enterprises, first for niche use cases. Looking forward, we're seeing key capabilities of Wi-Fi being a, a, a adapted and adopted by 3GPP, you know, EAP and licensed operation are coming to LTE, and we shall see whether they're successful in then deploying those systems in buildings. So I thank you. <laughs>